a long time ago, um, in the 80s, I was involved in a church that had a lot of weddings in the church. It was located off of Indiana University campus and still is. And a lot of students came and they wanted to get married in this church, which was great. Uh, but I will never forget one of those weddings where we had uh, a seven-year-old boy who was the one that was going to carry the ring in to the ceremony. And he did great at rehearsal. He was as cute as could be. I, I love weddings that have kids in them because it means that, that on the day of the wedding, not everything's going to go right. And there will always be something to smile about, no matter what happens. If there are kids in the wedding, there's going to be, there's going to be something fun. So I, I like that. The day of the ceremony, after he'd done so good in rehearsal and everything, he started at the back in that center aisle, and he took 10 steps, and he stopped in the middle of the aisle, and he goes, mm. and then he took 10 more steps, and he stopped, and he went, mm. And he, and he did this all the way down the aisle. I mean, all of us standing up front were absolutely dying of laughter by the time he got up there. The audience was absolutely in stitches. We had, we had no idea what was going on in this little boy's head. But then he came, and he stood next to the best man where he was supposed to stand perfectly. It was just great. So after the ceremony was over, you know, we pulled this little boy aside. We said, what were you doing and he said, well, you told me I was the ring bearer. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes when pastors stand up to talk about a certain subject, we want to make sure that we're being heard correctly. So today we're talking about being bearers of God's image, not the bearer of God's image bearers of God's image. And, and I want to make sure we all understand the topic we're on today because it's so easy for us to mishear things, just like that little boy in that wedding ceremony who was convinced he was supposed to be a bear and not a bearer. Uh, last week, when we launched this series on finding your true identity, we talked about this statement right out of 1 Samuel, where God says, People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at, and how many of you remember the answer? Say it, come on, louder. The heart. the heart, yes. The Lord looks at the heart. And because he looks at the heart, we understand something about what the heart is. So go forward two more. Yeah, another one, there we go. The, the heart is the integrated combination of our thoughts, our emotions, and our intentions. And that's what God sees when he looks at our heart. We, we go on today, and, and yes, I'm backing up in Scripture instead of going forward, but this fits so well uh, in this order. We're, we're looking today at Genesis chapter 1, when God is creating the heavens and the earth, and he says... In these words, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that, next slide, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God says, let us make humans in our image. God already exists at the beginning of time in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has always existed in community. That's why it's so dangerous for any of us to try to live isolated, individualistic lives. We belong in community because God created us in his own likeness, which lives and exists in community. Verse goes on, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule 
over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it and to all the, and all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. He gave all that to us. Everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. And Genesis says, and then God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and that was the sixth day. Here is the one thing I do not want you to forget when you leave this room today, or when you turn off your computer after watching us online. We are image-bearing people. We have been made in the image of God. And, and this doesn't mean that we look like God. That's not what this means at all. Just like when we talk about God looks at our heart, he's not looking at the, the thing in our chest that moves blood around our body. When God talks about heart, he's looking at our, our thoughts our emotions, and our intentions. And when God creates us in his image, he's, he's doing something that is beyond looks. It's beyond our eyesight. What God is creating when he makes us in his image is he gives us a free will. The, the ability to choose, I think it's the thing that makes us most like God. But it doesn't stop there. He, he gives us more than just the ability to choose. He gives us the capacity to be loved. He gives us the capacity to be loved. And he gives us the capacity to love in return. That's what makes us in God's image. That's why we're created in his image. Because we have the ability to make a choice. We, he gives us this freedom to choose between right and wrong, between good and evil, between following him and rejecting him. He gives us that privilege. And, and here's the marvelous thing. God chooses to love you and me. He didn't set this... The system up. He didn't create the world and everything in it and say, no, it's all going to be cooker cutter and predetermined. He, he did it with a free choice in mind. He did it with a free will that determines how you and I have the, the privilege of choosing to love God or rejecting him. And here's the thing. God lets people reject him. He lets people do that. And it's, it's one of the hardest things that I, as a pastor, deal with. That I, as a, a dad and a granddad and a friend, it's one of the hardest things I deal with when I watch people choosing to reject God. Because I think God makes the consequences of that rejection extremely clear. He says, the consequences of your rejection of me is eternal separation from me. You see, every one of us has, has been created to live eternally. Every single one of us will live forever. The, the question is where we're going to spend that eternity. Are we going to spend that eternity in the presence of God or outside of the presence of God? You see, we live today because God is present in this world and there's sunlight. And there's the contrast between darkness and light. We live in a world where, where there are good people who do good things. Not necessarily all God-fearing people, but goodness exists in this world because God created the world. We, we live in a world where it's not all tornadoes and hurricanes all the time. Oh, those things exist, and they're horribly destructive, and they happen because of the this fallen nature of the world that we live in. But we don't live with that continually. We actually have nice weather from time to time. And that's another gift from God. Can you imagine eternity separated from all that is light 
and good and promising, all that is hopeful, eternity without God, eternity separated completely from the presence of God is more disastrous than any screenwriter or movie producer or book writer could ever describe. It's living completely separated from the presence of God. And, you know, people make jokes all the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to hell, and when I get there, I'm going to party with my friends. No, there'll be no friendship in heaven. I mean, in hell. There'll be no friendship there. Friendship is something that, that happens because we're created in God's image. Friendship is good. There's no friendship in hell. There's no camaraderie in hell. There's no big party in hell. It's utter darkness, complete suffering. It is complete separation of everything that is good. Complete. And so God makes us in his image, and he says, you have the right, you have the responsibility, you have the free will to make a choice. You can choose to follow me, or you can choose to reject me. And by the way, just so that we're all on the same page here, um, just because somebody rejects Christ today doesn't mean that they won't have an opportunity to choose to follow him tomorrow. There is a choice. There is a choice. And that choice doesn't end until we die. But he gives, God gives us a free will. Now, see, I believe that to choose early to follow Jesus is really smart. Because God makes life better, and he makes us better at life every single time. God makes life better, and he makes us better at doing life. His presence makes life worthwhile. And even though I have just spent you know, a couple minutes describing what eternal separation from God looks like, I also want to tell you that Heaven and the promise of heaven and the promise of eternity in heaven is not all that a follower of Jesus gets. That's just kind of like the icing on the cake. Because if you follow Jesus, and the earlier the, a young person decides to follow Jesus, the better life is going to be. And, and I, I, I grew up in, in a time where the, the movies that were being made by Christians and the books that were being made by Christians were all these extravagant testimonies. 12-chapter book and 11 chapters was a, this graphic description of how bad I was before I met Jesus. Chapter 12, I meet Jesus, and now everything is wonderful. And I wanted a testimony like that. And God says, what are you doing? I remember as a teenager praying to God that I would have that kind of a testimony. I wanted that powerful testimony. But my friends, I grew up in a, a God-fearing home. I don't ever remember not honoring Jesus. I remember very clearly decision markers in my growing up years where I made a decision uh, to follow Jesus. And I remember distinctly uh, as a sophomore in high school choosing to declare Jesus as my Lord, the master, king, leader, boss, and conductor of my life. And I did that, I, I did that, and I've had a great life. I don't have some kind of wild, crazy testimony about how bad I was before I came to Jesus, because I've always known Jesus. Isn't that the kind of testimony you'd like? Isn't that, that the kind of testimony you'd like for your kids and your grandkids? Isn't that the kind of story that we want to tell? Not how bad I was, but how wonderful it is to live a life that God has made better because I followed him. And it hasn't been perfect. I mean, my life, some of you have heard bits and pieces of my story. My, my life hasn't been perfect. My dad died suddenly at 52 years of age. You know, my, I had to take care of my mother because the, my dad's estate was bankrupt, so I had responsibility for my mother until she died in 2014. You know, all, my, my wife died in 2009 from cancer. Not, it's not all been a bed of roses, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because 
I look at my experience and I say, God made life better because I chose to follow him because I made that free will choice. The other part of this dynamic of, of being made in the image of God is that I have the capacity to receive unconditional love. I have capacity to receive that love. You have the capacity to receive that love. No matter how unlovable you feel. And not only that, because you are an image bearer of God, you also have the potential, the capacity, the promise of being able to give love, unconditional love. That's not based on something you're going to get. But just because you're going to love because someone is there who needs to be loved. Unconditional love. Now, I, I know that there are people who argue and, and debate that it is our consciousness or self-awareness that makes us in God's image. But those, that consciousness and that self-awareness comes from the ability to choose and the capacity to love and be loved. That's where that consciousness and self-awareness even comes from. So I, I want to go back to that root and say the image bearing is the free will to, to choose. I don't know why that started. That's probably my fault for building the slides the way I did. Pe people, people, people are always tuned in to this idea that if I'm an image bearer of God, that somehow God ought to be coming through for me and meeting all my expectations, taking away all of my pain, taking away all of the things that I don't like, making sure that I win the lottery, making sure that I get the bank loan that I want, making sure that I get all my bills paid, making sure that all my relationships are clean and nice and don't have any conflict in them. They, they somehow think that because I'm an image bearer, God is going to smooth all that over. And, and friends, what God says to us, what God says to us is, I, I'm, that's not the way this life works. Because if, if you can look at it with me for a moment, I had this discussion yesterday with a teenager. If God made everything perfect for you, and there were no problems, no pain, no conflict, if God did that for you, there's no way that you would need God. There's no way that you would need him. If he made everything in your, right, in your life ideal, and he met all your expectations, why would you even need to talk to him or listen to him? And see, God, God set us up in this life not for the purpose of experiencing pain, but for the purpose of having the capacity to receive love, his love, and the capacity to love other people. Because that's what makes us in his image. He wants us to be that way and do those things and experience that in our lives. I, I find it really interesting that Paul, the Apostle Paul, the one who had that incredibly transformational experience. He was the one who could write the story about how bad he was before he met Jesus. And then he had the Damascus Road experience and he was transformed by God and he becomes the, the most uh, articulate theologian the world has ever known because he figured out how to take what Jesus taught, which is what the disciples shared with him. He figured out how to take that teaching and apply it to our lives and he writes you know, all, all his epistles that we have collected for us in what we call the New Testament to tell us how, did, how do we take Jesus' teaching and apply it to life. Paul is traveling. He gets to Athens, Greece. And in Athens, Greece, he's amazed to find all these statues, all these idols all over the place. They, they had idols to every god that they could think of. And, and Paul addresses them. He, he is in the Aragopagus, and, and he, he addresses them. 
And some people in their Bibles find a title that says, you know, to the unknown God, because Paul is speaking to the fact that he has seen a statue, an idol, that is labeled, that it's there to honor the unknown God. And Paul, who is a great cultural uh, commentator, says, oh, I know who this unknown God is. I can tell you who you've made this statue to. And this is what he says. Look at these, these words from Acts. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, but he doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Ah, can we go back and, and remember that we're made in God's image? Every human is made, is created in God's image. And not only that, is every human, every Jesus follower, actually has God's spirit in them. So every human is made in God's image, and every Jesus follower actually has God in them. And Paul goes on, he says, and, and God isn't served by human hands as if he needed anything. He doesn't. He doesn't even need us. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. For in him, Paul says, we live and move and have our being. And some of your own poets, Paul is addressing the people of Athens. He knows their literature. He was educated by the Romans. He knows what they believe and what they teach. He says, some of your own poets have said, we are all his offspring. Because they, in their poetry, they acknowledge that there was a God who made us all. Therefore, Paul says, because we're God's offspring, because of all these things that Paul has talked about, therefore, since we are all God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being, God, is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. That's not who God is. And that's not who you are. You are an image of God because of your ability to make choices, your ability to receive love, and your capacity to give love. This, this has this tendency to throw us off, my friends. Because we, we really have this image of God, and it's not helped by the media we have this image of God that somehow he's a judge sitting in heaven. He's got a great big, you know, 25-pound gavel, and he's just waiting for us to mess up. And when we mess up, he brings that gavel down on our heads, and he punishes us because we screwed up. And if that were true, every one of us would be six feet under. Because every one of us have sinned. Every one of us has, has not lived up to the expectations of what it is to be an image bearer of God. But God does not exist to punish us. He exists to love us. I want you to watch a video. It's, it's longer than most videos that I show in, as video clips and messages. But this is a powerful video Jackie's story um, has moved me many times in the years since I first discovered it. And some of you may have seen it before. But if you have seen it before, you'll be even more moved by this story. So watch Jackie's story on the screen with me. My life was absolutely the life of an ordinary poor kid. Um, we grew up in apartments and um, my mom was a single mom and we were really poor. We were the kids that couldn't afford to um, buy toothpaste. We made our own. We washed our clothes in the sink because the laundromat was too expensive. Um, if you've ever been a poor kid in an apartment, you know that you play a million times over alone in parking lots. So when I was six years old and my sister was seven, um, we were abducted by a stranger. It was the most terrifying experience of my life. Um, I didn't know who 
Jesus was. I'd never heard of God, so it was not, um, was God there in those moments in that time spent in the woods with um, someone who was bent on horrible things that happened to little girls in the woods. Um, I wasn't praying. I wasn't anything. I was alone. Um, so from the moment when I heard a whisper in my head and a whisper in my heart that said, run or die, I ran. And the moment I stepped out of the woods, my life was completely shattered. I did not grow up in a loving environment. Um, I grew up in a very crazy, horrible, dysfunctional family um, where we were just trying, trying to make life work. Um, and there was a lot of anger and a lot of sadness there. And so there was no moments to go to counseling. There was no moments to um, be told that it wasn't your fault. You were just the idiot who followed the guy who said that he was catching bunnies in the woods. So I lived out a very stereotypical life of girls that have been um, assaulted or molested or abused. Um, my life was very promiscuous. Um, I actually... <laughs> Uh, I started having sex when I was 13 years old. Um, and so I lived that life and that shame and that um, embarrassment um, throughout my entire life. By the time I got to college, um, even though my mom had become a Christian, even though she had married my stepdad, who was wonderful, um, and no matter how much I'd heard about Jesus for six years while my parents took me to church, he could love anybody. But if he knew everything about us, then he knew that I had always been bad. I'd always been just dirty and wrong. And no matter how much people could stand in front of me and tell me that he loved me, I knew the truth that he could love a girl like me. So by the time I got to college, I just did tons of drugs and I partied. And um, I, I, I think I had sex with everyone in college. Um, so uh, by the time that I got married to my husband, we were just crazy party people. That's what we did. Um, we just had a lot of fun and we did everything that you do if you party. It did not matter that we were the parents of two small boys. Um, we had a good time. And one of the things that we were proud of is that our kids could sleep through a party. Um, so that was impressive in our parenting. Um, we were not looking for Jesus. We were not searching for Jesus. My favorite thing in the world to do was to meet a Christian and let them know how stupid they were for what they believed because I had been to church and I had been to church camp and I knew how brainwashed they were. And this Jesus, well, that was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of. And he didn't help anybody. So my marriage had gotten to the place that really crappy marriages get to where um, you pretty much hate each other and all you do is drink and do drugs together and then um, just fight. And we were sitting on our porch one night, and I hated my husband. I hated him. And we were in the biggest, loudest argument on our front porch. And I was telling him all the reasons that I hated him. And he had written a letter because he was looking for a new job. And his letter said that he wanted this new job because he wanted to be closer to God and closer to his family. And I knew that that was a load of crap. And so I let him know that. And instead of being my husband that argued back with me, he started to cry. And I asked him what was wrong with him. And he looked at me and he said, Jackie, I don't know what is happening to me, but I think I'm supposed to go inside and ask Jesus to be my savior. So the first time I ever prayed with my husband was on the floor of our living room with my parents on the phone because I didn't know what to do with that information. Um, and it was our road to Damascus experience. And so with all my Eastern gods all over my house and my tarot cards tucked at the top of my closet and all my cassette tapes that had all the psychics versions of what my life was gonna be like, tucked all over our house. When he went to bed that night, I went and stood on the front porch. And it was the most tangible experience I've ever had where I knew that um, no Eastern God, no psychic, no um, intellectual prowess had ever stepped into a mess on my front porch. But this Jesus, he had just stepped into the mess on my front porch. And that realization that the little girl that was six years old, that had been lost somewhere in the woods, 
but it was not her voice that she heard or just survival instinct. And that whisper in my heart and in my head that said run or die. And then that was Jesus standing on the battlefield, fighting for my life. And because of that, I lived. Because of that, my life can be a testimony to him. So for us, because we were 30 when he came and claimed us, and there was a whole lot of water and there were a whole lot of bridges, um, it became this insane desire to know everything he said. Because if he could find two crazy, just horrible people on their front porch in the middle of their mess, well then he could find other people too. And then it was our job to just go and tell people that there was a savior that knew how horrible you had been. And he loved you every second of your really bad life. And so, um, so that's, that's it for me. That is absolutely it for me. We have four kids now. We have Jacob and Jude and Grace and Joshua. And um, I run this crazy grassroots ministry called Pruning Hooks. And, um, and I just love, I love Jesus. I love him so very much. Jackie makes the point very clear. Her life was sacred before she met Jesus. The reality of it is, is that every life is sacred. Every human life. Because we're made in the image of God. You are his image bearer. Whether you have acknowledged him or not. You bear his image. There's a sense in which you and I are called upon to recognize that God, in his inscrutable plan, has ordained for you and me to have a free will and the capacity to receive love and the potential to give love in ways that cannot even be comprehended. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if your story is like Jackie's. But I do know this. That Jackie discovered a God who loved her no matter what. That it doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter where you're going today. It doesn't matter what you've done. God loves you. And he cares deeply about you. And you have an opportunity to recognize the identity that he's already given you today.